All right, what's up? Welcome to another episode of Lunchtime with Luke. This episode, I think it might be a little longer, but I'm talking about something sort of important, maybe a little big-brained, but it's a, it's a, I guess, an editorial take. You're not going to hear that much, uh, but I think it's important to get out there. And that is, uh, nowadays you hear a lot of people talking about pseudoscience. You hear a lot of people talking about scientific consensus and uh, stuff like this. Now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you what I think about the idea of pseudoscience. I don't like it. Uh, let me t- let me explain why. Um, a while back, let's say back, back before uh, knowledge was institutionalized in the way that it is now. Nowadays, universities are literally billions and billions and billions of dollars of industry, really. Um, and they, people in an academic field compete for money, they compete for gov- government grants and stuff like that. Um, they compete for resources, and there's a lot of bureaucratic stuff involved. And that defines a lot of how, um, you know, academics either deal with other ideas or deal with, you know, that, that's how the theory internal kind of things kind of operate. A lot of things, a lot of decisions, unfortunately, are made for money. Now, one hallmark of this, you know, when you look at the early 20th century uh, and academia was becoming sort of institutionalized in the same way, if you're in a field where there are a bunch of competing ideas, it's important for you, your particular idea or your particular methodology to win out above all others. Now, it is my firm belief, now the concept or the term pseudoscience has floated around for a couple centuries now. Originally, it referred to just alchemy. But of course, there are big brain takes to talk about alch- alchemy is a misunderstood subject, but that's for some another video. Um, but uh, in the past hundred years or so, the term pseudoscience is used all the time. And it's my theory that this became a concept, that is pseudoscience doesn't mean bad science. It doesn't mean um, science that accidentally arrives at the wrong conclusion. Pseudoscience, the idea behind it is that there are some methods at looking at problems or there are some theoretical frameworks that aren't even true or false. They are not even, they don't even reach uh, whatever, me- you know, maybe your metric is, you know, a kind of Popperian falsifiability. That's usually the thing that people talk about nowadays. But however you talk about it, pseudoscience is supposed to be some method of inquiry that isn't even true or false. It's not even worthy of consideration. Now, you can say whatever you want about this, but it's my theory, maybe my conspiracy theory, that pseudoscience is, which wasn't a big idea a hundred or so years ago, became a big deal after academia become, became highly institutionalized. It became a big business, and you know, thousands of people are academics, and they're competing for a whole bunch of money, and it's important for them to win out. Now, why do, why do I say this? I say this because calling if you're competing against some other framework theoretical framework it's one thing to say that their framework is wrong or uh, that's just another way of looking at things but it's more biting to say something like their theoretical framework is just not even science it's pseudoscience it's not even worthy of consideration now first off depending on how you define a theoretical framework Every theoretical framework is pseudoscience. Like every, um, you know, to I mentioned Popper a second ago. So Popper, Karl Popper originally popularized the idea of pseudoscience as we now know. And he proposed, his idea, of course, if you don't know, is, um, you know, pseudoscience is something that is not falsifiable. Okay, you can't disprove a pseudoscience. So his original examples were things like Marxism. So in, uh, if you're a Marxist, if you're a good Marxist, you can basically explain anything that happens in the world. Um, that sounds like a good thing, but for Popper, the idea is you could explain, uh, you know, let's say the interest rates increase. You can have a reason for why that happens, or let's say the interest rate, rates decrease. You can have a reason for that as well. There's no, there's no set of facts in the world that can disprove your worldview. And he argues that of Marxism and a couple other things that aren't super important. Now, I'll say, of course, I am not a Marxist. I'm very un-Marxist. I'm very anti-Marxist. But when I'm addressing a Marxist, I don't feel the need to say that their framework is not, it's just technically not even worthy of consideration. And in fact, if that is the standard you hold for 
you know, something like Marxism, really any theoretical framework works exactly like this. So in linguistics, for example, we have, uh, you know, for, since the 50s, 60s, 70s, however you want to calculate it, we've had uh, this thing, generative grammar, Chomsky and grammar, if you want to call it that, but because it's sort of stems from Noam Chomsky. But, uh, you know, generative grammar is, as a theoretical framework, is really not falsifiable. Okay? And I, I don't like generative grammar. I think anyone who knows me knows that. But I'm not saying that is a bad thing. Um, I'm saying if you're a good generative grammarian, you can look at any data set and you can make it compatible with your theory. Really, your theory, in the same way that Marxism is, is a theoretical language for talking about the world. And that's not even unvaluable. Sometimes when I'm talking to a linguist about a particular um, linguistic phenomenon, even though I don't believe in generative grammar, I find it helpful sometimes to use their terms because they might have a way of describing a phenomenon or not. But the method of assessing whether this framework is legitimate or not shouldn't be whether there's some data point that can falsify it. Now, some I think Chomsky has said, oh, generative grammar could be falsified if, uh, you know, there were counting in languages, which is, or something like that. Or counting meaning like, uh, you know, number, or like uh, n numbers in grammar in the sense of like, oh, in this position, this number position, something happens. Now, of course, re in reality, generative grammar could do something like that. In fact, there are many linguistic phenomena that are so-called second position phenomena or sometimes third position phenomena that happens all over the place and generative grammar has basically uh, conventionalized a way of dealing with that um, but I, I don't necessarily think that falsifiability is a good metric for pseudoscience but anyway my, my point wider is that the concept of pseudoscience I think has that particular purpose of you can write off an alter alternative way of thinking as simply being not worthy of consideration not even dealing with it now uh, an, a thing associated with that is the idea of scientific consensus, and that is the idea that um, it, it's almost like a Whig history view of, of science that really only a Redditor could believe in, or only someone who does isn't exposed to, uh, I guess, how things actually work in academia could possibly believe in. Maybe I'm saying that arrogantly, but, um, you know, it's the idea that, you know, scientists, there's this incremental movement in science, and that is we gradually get closer to the truth. We have the peer review system, and, uh, you know, it's supposed to be effective, and it gradually moves us step by step. And if even if we're way off now in the future, it's going to lead us in the, the right direction. And the thing you have to keep in mind is, again, when you have a theoretical framework, which in order to even look at the world, you have to have a way of interpreting data. Um, as long as you have one of those, you're going to have it, you know, that you could be a generative grammarian or you could be a Marxist or something like this. And any kind of data points you can integrate into your worldview and that's not necessarily going to change it. That's just going to, you know, maybe detail you. You might Marxism might be a terrible philosophy that might be totally off and might produce drastically terrible consequences. But that doesn't mean you can't make sense of the world with it, you know, uh, in in scientific terms. Now, what I'm what I'm trying to say is that in any scientific field. Um, just having more work done or having more incremental science, having more papers come out that, uh, you know, have all these impressive p-values or something, uh, due to the way that, you know, scientific consensus works, you can find yourself on what is effectively, I guess, a local maximum, if you know what I mean. That is, um, there might be some better, uh, more elegant way of understanding the world that might I guess get at the lower level mechanisms help us actually understand things deeper um, but we can still be stuck in a local maximum where we see, we feel like we know everything and there's nothing more to do um, so anyway now additionally in this now one of the problems I think that pseudoscience brings as a concept is the idea that the only proper science there is to do is this kind of incremental science. That is, you can't have anything that is, um, you know, pseudoscience, you know, I guess if you talk to someone with a, a view like this, they will say something like, oh, well, if you come into science with uh, ulterior motives, you know, let's say um, you have, you belong to some weird religious cult and they have weird ideas about the world. Or let's say you have, um, you know, some particular ideology is convenient for you. Or maybe it just it seems more elegant to you. You just like some ideas more than others. Um, there's a tendency for people to say that that's a bad thing. 
Now, my perspective is pretty much everyone has, I mean, literally everyone has a perspective. Literally everyone has interests. Literally everyone has biases. And for me, the difference is not having biases or not having them, but it's being honest about the perspective you have versus pretending you don't have it and pretending you're objective or even worse, not being aware of the perspective that you have. That's even more, that's even more dangerous because there are a lot of people who, uh, you know, will get entrenched in a field and they'll internalize all the assumptions about that field and then they'll be totally unable to question it. Now, in reality, where scientific progress, if something like that even exists, but where scientific innovation comes from is from pseudoscience. It comes from crazy ideas. It comes from ideas that are motivated stupidly. Now, I, I put up a blog post sort of related to this a couple months ago, and I used the example of, of plate tectonics. So plate tectonics used to be a pseudoscience. It was mocked as a pseudoscience for decades, especially in the United States. Now, plate tectonics, where did it come from? Well, it came from the elementary observation that, well, hey, dude, oh, actually, hey, dude, like South America, it like sort of fits into Africa, man. Like maybe like, dude, the continents just like float. And like, that's, that's originally how they got to where they were, dude. Like, what if that's the case? Now that's a stupid idea. It's also an idea that's true. <laughs> I mean, it's now accepted as being basically true. And it, it wasn't accepted as true through incremental science. It was just gradually, you know, gradually there was a kind of paradigm shift and people acknowledged it. Um, but it's a stupid idea that had a stupid motivation, but it also ended up being true. Another example in linguistics, um, a while back there was a, a lady, um, you know, she was a scholar, uh, Maria Gimbutas, okay? Now, she had, I guess, this was around the 60s, 70s, she had all these crazy feminist notions, all right, um, that, you know, people don't, even feminists don't believe in nowadays. Um, that is, she had this idea, she was an archaeologist by trade, if, if that's a trade, by, by scholarly pursuits, and, uh, you know, she had found a bunch of old uh, European figurines that were really thick, you know, th these kind of feminine idols from early Europe, and she created this entire worldview that uh, uh, pre-Indo-European Europe was filled with, you know, goddess worship and, uh, you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, you, you might be familiar with, like, the Da Vinci Code. That's actually related to, to her kind of, or this sort of strand of thinking. But it was a, a whole bunch of more or less nonsense pulled from very flimsy data. Now, one of her, uh, uh, I guess, um, part of that worldview was the idea that Indo-European people moved into Europe and conquered these peaceable people and imposed a patriarchal society, blah, blah, blah. And the Indo-Europeans she associated with a particular archaeological culture in, uh, you know, sort of, uh, I guess, the Ukraine area. Now, her idea is not, you know, her worldview is not really scientific. She reached, you know, crazy conclusions and had a crazy motivation, but her views about Indo-Europeans are basically now accepted to be true. They had a bad motivation. She might have had gone through bad thinking or, you know, a bad mental trail of thought to reach that conclusion. But uh, we now see that, you know, considering that crazy idea, idea for a bit, it actually seems like it's pretty much true. Well, not the Paleolithic Europe being all peaceful and stuff, but her specific statements about the Indo-European culture moving into Europe uh, what archaeological culture they're associated with, that's now pretty much accepted to be uh, true, despite the fact that she, you know, got it, you know, re you know, with sort of funny motivations. Now, in the same way, you know, my experience in academia, I'll tell you this, you know, there are a lot of fancy papers with, with a bunch of fancy statistics, but the reality is, um, a lot of people reach their conclusions. I mean, no one no one waits till the data to make their conclusions. I'll, I'll just be realistic about that. And, uh, you know, a lot of these people don't even know how to use statistics. Now, I, I will tell you my, I don't believe in using bad statistics because I, I honestly avoid statistics because I think in most situations, despite the fact that people use it all the time, it's not appropriate to use. Um, and I, I tend to avoid it. Now, I will say in my experience, there have been, for example, I remember there was a time when I was in graduate school, well, I still am in graduate school, but there was one professor who, uh, you know, had a, a friend of mine, you know, elicit grammaticality judgments on a Likert scale. And that's like, you know, from one to seven, how acceptable is this sentence? How acceptable is this sentence? And what she did with the data 
it, her statistics was taking all the Likert scale numbers and adding them up and then comparing them, which is absurd. You wouldn't even like I, I wouldn't do that as an elementary schooler, but that's how she did it. And, uh, you know, she reached the conclusions she wanted to. And that's how she reads. And I'm sure when that ends up in a published paper, it's going to be much more refined. But that's that's like, uh, do you even understand what the Likert scale is? Or there was another time I was asked by a professor to do, you know, he had asked me, um, here, take some data. And I want you to, you know, I want you to analyze this data. I want you to find out, you know, what's really going on. And I was like, what, what kind of tests you want me to do? You want me to do uh, ANOVAs, you know, an analysis of variance or something else? And he was like, well, you know, you know what? Just uh, take the numbers. Uh, add them together and look at the averages and compare them and see which one is bigger. And I was like, okay. I mean, you're you're not gonna you don't care about noise or anything like that. But you know, I, I say this not to say that uh, any of these people are bad scholars or something like that. But it does sort of get at well, uh, you know. Uh, but um, it does sort of get at the fact that a lot of the decision making that people actually make in the fields is not this. Pre it's not this pretense that people put out there of these scientific papers with all these numbers and stuff that, you know, every, there are no, there are no uh, leaks in the data or something like that. A lot of it is just intuitional stuff um, or uh, stuff you sort of squint your eyes and look at data and you sort of see what you want to see. Um, and that, that is even with all the pretenses, we haven't transgressed further than that. So what I'm saying, I'm not saying we should have no, no standards in science. What I'm saying is we should have no pretense. Now, another example I was thinking about um, uh, was, uh, you know, there are a lot of people who get upset at this guy, uh, Graham Hancock. I don't know if you heard of him. He, you know, he basically, he's this boomer who writes um, books about how there was, you know, possibly an ancient civilization, you know, and uh, archaeologists, they don't want to admit it in this ancient civilization that was, you know, it's cultural tendrils are all over the world in all these ancient cultures or whatever. And, you know, whatever, he's sort of popular and in boomers and stuff like that, I guess. I think it was on Joe Rogan and got popular because of that. Uh, but there are a lot of people in the field who would just get really mad at this guy. They'll call him a pseudoscientist, a pseudo-archaeologist. And my perspective is, the thing with Graham Hancock is, Graham Hancock or, and other people like this, they don't pretend to be anything that they're not. Graham Hancock, if you read his books, it's not him pretending to be some hardcore scientist. It's him saying, oh, I found this random thing, and oh, man, I remembered from this Google search that uh, someone said something about this archaeological inscription, and I compared all this stuff, and hey, look at this, maybe this is interesting. Um, none of it is him trying to be some hardcore guy, it's just him throwing ideas out there. And my point, as I said earlier, is that a lot of times scientific innovation comes from people with stupid ideas who state them stupidly for stupid reasons. And when you put up these arbitrary... Uh, I, I, I guess, um, arbitrary rules as for what should be pseudoscience or what should be real science, you're, yeah, you're getting rid of a bunch of crap, but that's not the issue. You're getting rid of all of everything that can possibly challenge your assumptions, even if they're ugly looking. So my perspective, you know, my perspective, you know, you might know that I'm, I'm sort of a proponent of the ideas that are associated with uh, Paul Feyerabend, and uh, that is epistemological anarchism. And uh, I think that's a meme-worthy term, I mean, because he didn't invent the idea. Really, it's just the default way that all people in all times have looked at science. That is, um, what, the, what that's supposed to mean is there are no standards per se for science. Everything is, you know, all methods of analysis, everything from hardcore statistics to folklore to religion to rumor to, you know, uh, experiments. All of this kind of stuff is worthy of consideration, and we should always take it in mind. And that doesn't mean abolishing our standards, um, but all pretty much all scientific works that were made before this, you know, era where we have to pretend of something different. All scientific works made before then, uh, really, they combine hardcore science, hardcore work with lots of baseless speculation, lots of emotion, lots of bias, and there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's better to be blatant with what your biases are. It is more informative for everyone else, else out there. So anyway, this has been a sort of long boomerang or um, lunchtime with Luke, Smith Wars, but I will see you guys next time.